to attend a, a conference in dynamic all systems here. So I think that as freshmen, we were uh, very much impressed by the uh, uh, scientific activities here at IMPA, yeah, and I also guess. by the beauties of the, uh, the city of uh, Rio that uh, I could offer us. And uh, we had a dramatic experience playing uh, volleyball, volleyball yes, against uh, <laughs> professional uh, uh, players. So two girls that actually won, uh, I think, the bronze medal in Barcelona. So I'm not sure yeah. that you're going to uh, talk about this. Uh, no, <laughs> we'll see that in a minute, and so I'll leave you the floor to talk about the geometric Bogomolov conjecture. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I remember this volleyball on the, yeah, I think it was on Ipanema, but uh, I'm not sure. Okay, so I, I want to discuss um, the geometric Bogomolov conjecture. So in fact, I think Bogomolov never conjectured this geometric uh, conjecture. Um, and it's, uh, in fact, it's, it's an example in which I, I hope you will see some nice interplays between uh, problems coming from Diophantine geometry and problems and techniques coming from dynamical systems. So in fact, my goal is to illustrate this interaction between uh, arithmetic or Diophantine geometry and, and dynamical systems. Okay, so that's, that's the main goal of the talk. And to start, I, I want to explain the I think the most important thing is that uh, in, in Diophantine geometry, a point has a size. Okay? In, in differential geometry, a point is a point. But, but here, uh, a point has a size. So let's start with that. Okay, so so the, a point will be a point of the projective space. So I, I take a field, K. So it's, it's a field like Q or Q bar or maybe C of T, so frac rational fraction in one variable. This type of field, so it's not a Gaussian field, it's, it's just a, a field. Okay. And, and the projective space Pn, let's say over the field K, is uh, just a set of lines in uh, K n plus one in this vector space. And by a line, I mean a line containing the origin, a line through the origin. So it's a subspace of dimension one in this vector space. So to determine, to determine a line, you just take a vector, a non-zero vector, and then you get a line, okay? And so to get coordinates on Pn, you just take the usual coordinates in k to the n plus one. So x zero, x one, x two, x three, up to x, and that the coordinates of the vector, except that if you multiply all the coordinates by the same number, then you get the same line, the same line, okay? So it's up to multiplication by a common uh, number. So I denote the coordinates like that. So homogeneous coordinates in Pn. So a, a bunch of n plus one numbers in K modulo multiplication by a common, a common factor. Okay, so now you take a point of Pn with coordinates in K, and I want to measure the size of the point. And I will do that for points with coordinates in Q, or Q bar, or, or C of T. Okay. So let's start with Q. Let's assume K is Q. And take such a point. Then the Xi, the coordinates, are just rational numbers. So you can multiply all of them by the smallest, I mean by a large number such that all coordinates now are uh, integers, okay? So such a point, you can write it A naught, A1, up to An, with all Ai integers. Okay, you just multiply by the small on, smallest common uh, multiple of all the denominators. And if you do that, uh, there are integers, and moreover, they have no common factor. Except uh, maybe plus or minus one, of course. Okay, so you, you choose such, such a way to write your point, and then it's unique up to multiplication by minus one, and you decide that the size of the point, which is called the height, is just the log of the maximum of the coordinates h of x, x is my point, 
is just the log of the maximum for all coordinates of the absolute value of Ai. And that's the definition of the height of the point, so it's the size of my point. So roughly it's a number of, of digits that you need to write your, your point with integer coefficients. Okay. So that's the first way to think about it. Okay. Now I want to describe another way, a second way to express exactly the same notion of height, but without this uh, trick of writing rational coordinates as integer coordinates after some nice multiplication by a, a large integer, okay? So I want to use my rational coordinates, my rational uh, xi. And to do that, I will um, uh, use periodic absolute values. Okay, so you take a prime p. And take now some integer a. Then you can say, say a is, is not zero. Then you can write a as some power of p, p to the r times q, where p and q are coprime. And you declare that the size measured with the periodic absolute value of a, so the notation is a index p, is just p to the minus r. Okay, so a number is, uh, is small if it is divisible by a high power of, of p. So then you get a notion of absolute value and you can extend it uh, to rational numbers. So if a over b is some rational number, then by definition the size, the periodic size of a over b is just the quotient of the size of a mod, I mean, periodically and the size of b periodically. Okay, so this extends the notion of periodic absolute value to a mod b, I mean a divided by b, so to all rational numbers. So, and it, it is an absolute value. By this I mean that uh, if you compute the periodic absolute value of a product, it's a product of the absolute values, and if you compute the absolute value of the sum, then in fact it's less than the maximum of the two periodic absolute values. And now the, this formula for the height here can be decomposed into a formula uh, which involves all um, periodic size of the coordinates. So I use the xi coordinates, and I want to compute the height of, of x, so x is x0, x1, up to xn, so the xi are in q, and then this is the sum of the log of the maximum of the coordinates you measure periodically for all prime p, including p infinity. So when p is, is infinite, I mean that this absolute value is just the usual absolute value. Okay, so for p equal to infinity, this absolute value xj is just a classical absolute value in R. Okay. And so this, the fact is that these two formulas, the simplest one here, which requires uh, for its definition that I write my point with integral coordinates, is the same as this formula, which works for any writing of my point with rational coordinates. Okay. So let me just explain on an example. If you take the point, say, Two third, so two third, I don't know, five over two. So I have two coordinates and I want to compute the height. So let's do that with the first uh, explanation that I gave. So I need to multiply by six so that there is no denominator. So this point is the same as four fifteen. Okay, and the maximum of the classical absolute values, I mean, here I have four, here I have 15, so the height is log of 15. Okay. 
And now with the second viewpoint, so what are the interesting uh, uh, prime numbers P? So P is two is interesting, P is three, P is five. Okay, so I need to compute the absolute values uh, of the coordinates um, for all these uh, prime numbers. And what do I get? So I get something like, uh, for when P is two, I get log two. When P is three, so it's because of these two here, I get log, th log three. And when P is five, uh, this is small and this is, uh, the size is one and the size is one over five. So it's, the largest one is one. So log one is zero. And when P is infinite, so what is the largest number? It's this one. So that's the contribution for P equal to infinity. And now you do the, I mean, you, you simplify this formula and you get log of 15. Okay, so it's two ways to compute the same thing. And this number that you get at the end is the height of the point X. Okay, that's very good because now a point with rational coordinates has, has a size, has a height. I want to do the, exactly the same thing, but for a field like this one. Okay, so I want to measure the size of a point, but now the coordinates are not rational numbers. The coordinates are rational fractions, okay, of one variable. So they are functions of one variable t. So let's uh, get here. Okay, so just do it again. So k is now c of t. So if I take a point x, in the projective space with coordinates in this field, then now the, the numbers xi are not numbers, they are functions. Okay. So each xi is a, is a rational function of the variable t, so it's something like pi of t over qi of t, and it's a rational fraction of the variable t. And now the height of x, by definition, is the maximum of the degree of this rational fraction. That's the definition. Okay, this definition is equivalent to this one, and I want to, to spend a few minutes to explain why it is equivalent. Okay, why it is a good uh, counterpart of this height definition when you move from rational numbers to rational uh, fractions. Like that. Okay, the point is the following. Uh, if you replace prime numbers with uh, the equivalent definition here, what you get is the following trick. So first, let me explain the first viewpoint. So first viewpoint is Maybe I should have said that before defining this. So you write, you can write x like that. So you can write x r0, r1. I think I went too quickly. So first I write it like that, where now every rj is a polynomial function. So there is no denominator with no common factor of positive degree. And then the height of x is the maximum of the degrees of the RJ. Okay, so forget about this formula. I, I should have been more careful before writing it. Okay, so that's the first viewpoint. The second viewpoint is the one with periodic absolute values. What is the role? What is what? What we replace periodic p prime numbers are uh, prime ideals in this uh, ring, and you do it like as follows. Uh, this height 
is uh, the sum over all uh, numbers alpha in, in C of uh, the, and it's, it's the maximum over J0 to N, and it computes the order of vanishing of the function, so pi over q by, at alpha. Okay, so you do that like this. Okay, so it means the following. Instead of looking at the power of p, which appears in A, here you look at the power of the monomial, I mean, of the linear factor t minus alpha to the r in the rational fraction. Pg mod Qg. Okay. And this R here is minus the order of vanishing. I mean, this minus R is minus the order of vanishing. Okay, so now we have a notion of height for rational points and a notion of height for points with coordinates in this, in this field. Okay. And they are similar in the sense that uh, they compute the size of the point first when you look at points with integral coordinates as the number of digits you need to write. And here for rational fraction as a degree of the polynomial uh, RG that you need to write. But so they are, they are really equivalent. And the good thing here is that this notion, this second notion of height in the function field case, it's quite geometric because you see the degree of a map, it's like the area of its graph. So the remark is that a degree of RT, which is in C of T, is more or less the same as the area of the Riemann surface that you get by looking at uh, the graph of R in, not in C times C for the Euclidean metric, but in P1 times P1. So if you prefer the Riemann sphere times the Riemann sphere for any Riemannian metric on P1 times P1. So if you fix a Riemannian metric and you compute the degree of the graph, then roughly it's this, uh, excuse me, you compute the area of the graph, then roughly you get the same thing as the degree. Okay. So in fact, this height here, which is analogous to the, uh, the one you define in Diophantine geometry, is basically uh, the area of this Riemann surface. So when I will say that I will look at points with small height, I will mean that I will look at points with small area, for instance. Okay? Okay, so that, that was the most important thing in my talk. Okay, so somehow I should, I could stop here in some sense. If you, if you understand that, I'm happy, okay? It's very classical for people in diophantine geometry. Yeah, it's very classical. It's obviously, it's, I mean, if you come back to the first definition, it's the most basic uh, notion of size that you can cook up to, when you look at points with integral coordinates. And it's quite useful. Yeah. Now that I have done that, um, I need to say one more thing, in that I described it just for rational numbers and for this field here. But you can cook a similar definition for Q bar, so for algebraic numbers. So it's more involved, but you have a natural notion of height for uh, rational, I mean, for algebraic numbers or for algebraic functions. So if you change this field in its uh, algebraic closure, for instance. Okay. So there are notions of heights which are similar to these two notions that I described over Q bar and over C of T bar, the algebraic closures of these fields. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. Now, what I want to explain is a beautiful theorem which is uh, due to, I mean, I will say to whom it is due, 
um, which is an, an answer to the so-called Bogomolov conjecture. And so this Bogomolov conjecture concerns uh, Diophantine geometry. So it concerns points with um, coordinates in Q bar on some special uh, varieties, so special subsets of the projective space. And this, these varieties are the varieties which have all the structure you, you may want to put on a variety. It's algebraic, and at the same time, it's a group. So these abelian varieties are commutative algebraic groups that you can put in some projective space. Let's look at them. Okay, so A will be a sub-variety in some PN. So it's a sub-variety, which means that it is defined by polynomial equations in the homogeneous coordinates in PN. So I have a finite set of uh, polynomial equations, and I look, look at the common zeros, it's my sub-variety A, defined over Q bar, or to simplify over Q, which means that the equations are, the coefficients are, of the equations are just rational numbers. And now I will assume more, I will assume that this variety is a commutative algebraic group. So it has a group structure. You can take the sum of two elements. There is a neutral element. You can take the inverse of an element. And all these operations, this group operation and the neutral element are defined over Q bar or over Q. Okay, so everything is defined over Q. So for instance, the set of points of A with rational uh, coordinates is not empty because the neutral element is such a point. Okay, that's the definition of an abelian variety. An example is given by the, cube, the smooth cubic curve. For instance, you can take a curve in the plane. Y squared is x cubed plus x a, a, a x plus b. Uh, assume it is smooth. Then you get a curve in the plane. And you can decide that the group law on this curve, so there is a group law on this curve, and one way to define it is to say that the sum of three points is zero if the three points are on a line. Okay, so this geometric uh, intersection property means that the three points on the curve have sub zero for the group law. And the neutral element in the, is a point you don't see, which is at infinity. So that's an example of an abelian variety. If you think of an abelian variety as a complex manifold, so you look at points with complex coordinates, then it's the same as a quotient of a vector space. So the tradition is to denote it the dimension by, by G. So G is a dimension of, of A divided by some lattice so lambda is a lattice in C to G. So it's a, it's a discrete subgroup and the quotient is compact. And if you forget the complex structure and you just look at it as, as a Lie group, as a real Lie group, then it's just uh, R to the 2G divided by Z to the 2G. Okay, so here it's as a real or real analytic Okay, so this is the type of object I want to look at. So the first thing you need to, to to remember that A is an algebraic variety, okay? So I can use algebraic geometry. And it's defined over Q, so I can look at points of A with coordinates in Q, or in Q bar. And at the same time, 
uh, A is a, is a real Lie group, and as a real Lie group, it's just a torus. Okay. So for instance, let's look at torsion points. So points X in A, say A of C, with complex coordinate, such that uh, there exists an N, a positive N, with N times X, it's X plus X, so you take addition of X with itself N times for the group row is zero, so zero is a neutral element for your group row. Okay. So first let's look at it uh, with a last viewpoint. Torsion, torsion points are just elements of Q to the 2G, modulo Z to the 2G, in R to the 2G, modulo Z to the 2G. So torsion points uh, form a dense subset of this torus, if you think about them just as elements in this uh, real Lie group. Okay, so in particular, are dense for the usual topology. I mean, usual topology, uh, I, I'm not really an algebraic geometer, for, so for me, the usual topology is just a usual, usual basic Euclidean topology. It's not the Zariski topology. But of course, it implies that it, they are dense for the Zariski topology. And now, look, look at these points uh, from the point of view of uh, algebraic geometry. This transformation, x goes to n times x, is an algebraic transformation. This point is defined over Q. This algebraic transformation is defined over Q. So the pre-image of the origin by this transformation is also defined over Q, or Q bar. Okay. So the set of points you get are points defined by algebraic equation with um, a coefficients in Q. So the points you get are defined over Q bar. So torsion points are also points in with coordinates in Q bar. Okay, so torsion points form a dense subset of A of C given by points with coordinates in Q bar. Okay, now I want to look at, at the size of the points and what can be said of the size of, of the height of points with coordinates in Q bar are on an abelian variety. So there is a very nice uh, trick, which is the following. So here comes some kind of IDs uh, related to dynamical systems. So you take a point X in A with coordinates in Q bar. And then you multiply X by N. Then you get a new point with coordinates in Q bar. So you can compute the height of this new point and you want to compare it to the height of X. And the formula is that this is roughly equal to N square times H of X. So when, if I Divide by n square, I can take a limit, and this is well defined, and you, you get a new function, which is a limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n square h of nx. So believe me, it's well defined, and this is the derontate height, or canonical height associated to the dynamical system given by the multiplications by n. And this new height, it's very well behaved, and it's the good notion of height on a billion varieties, because it's related to the group structure. So for, ex for instance, if you take a torsion point, Then you look at multiplication by n, you see the orbit of the point is finite. Uh, 
And thus, these numbers here form a finite set of numbers. You divide by n squared, so the limit is 0. Okay, so all torsion points are, or if you prefer, all pre-periodic points for multiplication by 2, for instance, have height 0. And in fact, it's an equivalence. Okay, so this is related to a, a finite, uh, finiteness result, which is due to Northcott, which I, I will not describe. But torsion points are exactly uh, points with canonical height equal to 0. Okay, so this is well behaved with respect to the group law, or if you prefer, with the dynamics of multiplication by, by 2, for instance. So we have a notion of height, which is be better than the naive des description that I give at the beginning. And this is the canonical height. And now the Bogomolov conjecture uh, is the following theorem. It has been proved uh, a little bit more than 20 years ago. And it's due to uh, Spiro, Ulmo, and, and Jung. I think Spiro and Ulmo, it's OK. And, and Jung, it's uh, Shu Wu. Uh, uh, junk, and the theorem is the following. So you want to describe subsets of the abelian variety such that they have a lot of points with very small height. Okay, so let me state it precisely. You take x in A, a sub-variety, uh, assume that it is irreducible, so it's made of just one piece. It's not the union of two sub-varieties, just one, one irreducible sub-variety. And you look at the set of points in X with very small height. So you fix epsilon, and you define X of epsilon is a set of points X with coordinates in Q bar. So everything here is say, defined over Q bar. So points, with points which are contained in X and their coordinates in Pn are coordinates in, in Q bar, or algebraic numbers, such that the canonical height of x is smaller than epsilon. Okay, so this is just a definition. And now you assume that for every positive epsilon, this set is dense in x. So this means that for every given epsilon, you have a lot of points in x such that when you iterate the map, the, the map multiplication by n, then the growth is like n squared, but very, just the, the factor in front of the n squared is very small. It's less than epsilon. Okay? So that's the assumption. And the conclusion is that x can be written like that, so it's a plus uh, A prime, where A is a torsion point, and A prime is an abelian subvariety in A. Okay, so this means basically that X is a subtorus of the torus A, translated by some torsion points. Okay. So it's, it's a very special sub-variety because it's up to translation, it's just a torus in A. And the density here, so now I, I need to, to become an algebraic geometer. The, the density is, a, I mean, the weakest density you can think of is the density for the Zariski topology. Okay. So there is one direction which is uh, even not written in this statement, is that if x is a... Um, is a torus or, or t torus translated by some torsion point, then points with sm small height are dense in X. In fact, torsion points, which have height zero, are already dense in X. But the reverse implication is this theorem. And if you don't look at points with small height, but uh, just torsion points, so you assume that uh, X of zero, so the set of points in X with height zero, or if you prefer, torsion points 
if you assume that torsion points are dense in X, then X is a translate of a torus. Uh, this is uh, due to Renault. And this statement is exactly the, the, the Bogomolov conjecture uh, turned into a theorem. Okay, so this is uh, Bogomolov conjecture. Okay. okay so, so the statement is as follows. You first look at torsion points. So it says that you take a subvariety of A, and you say that a point is special if it is a torsion point. So the most special point that you can think of with respect to the group law. Assume that spatial points are dense in X, then X is spatial. X is a subtorus. Okay, so it's the type of, of statement when you say that a subvariety with a lot of spatial points is itself spatial. From a dynamical point of view, it says I take a subvariety and I assume that uh, pre-periodic points are dense in X then X itself is pre-periodic as a sub-variety. Okay? So this is what the theorem says when epsilon is zero, when you look at uh, torsion points. And now the, when epsilon is uh, positive but as small as you want, it's some kind of uh, quantit quantitative version of this uh, first version that I gave with torsion points. Okay? Okay, so let me uh, take a few minutes to explain uh, an ingredient, or I will just explain. Uh, yeah, I, I want to explain that this type of, of statement is, is in fact related to a property of dynamical systems, which is related to equidistribution of points uh, that you obtain by uh, dynamical means. Okay, so I, so, so the statement related to this theorem is the following. You take a sequence of points in, in A, say a sequence of point Xn, such that uh, Xn is defined over Q bar, and the canonical height of Xn goes to zero when n goes to infinity. So you get a sequence of points of smallest and smallest height. Okay. But typically these points, the, they are algebraic, integ algebraic numbers, uh, which, I mean the coordinates are algebraic numbers, uh, of higher and higher degree. So the degree of the extension that you need to write to compute your, the algebraic extension is, goes to infinity, but the height goes to zero. So you take such a sequence, and given a point xn, you take its orbit under the action of the Galois group. So all the conjugates of the coordinates. You, you get a cloud of points on A, and the theorem is that this cloud of points equidistribute to the Haar measure on A, so the Lebesgue measure on the torus. I mean, it, it does it equidistribute to the Haar measure, except if a subsequence is contained in some fixed abelian subvariety like that. Okay, so in fact, the dynamical statement uh, related to this result is an equidistribution statement. And I, I want to state one theorem, which is, uh, due to, so it's like a parenthesis in my, in my talk. Uh, it's due to Bilou, Otissier, and there is a new version, I mean, uh, the, I guess um, the most general version is, is due to E1. Uh, I just want to describe it in, in one example. So it, it's like a parenthesis, so you can forget about uh, everything here. You take, take f of z, which is uh, z squared plus c. So c, a complex number, and, and, and z is a complex number. Okay, so it's just the dynamics. We are looking at the dynamics of the z squared plus c, classical uh, Julia Fatou theory. Then you can compute the following thing. So g of z is the speed at which a point uh, z goes to infinity when you iterate uh, f. So it's uh, a limit. 1 over 2 to the n, log, you take the nth point in the orbit, you compute its absolute value in the complex plane, and you look at this speed. And you get, you get some function. It's a subharmonic sub function, so you can compute the Laplacian of g, and you get a measure mu f, which is a probability measure. 
Okay? So th this is pure dynamical systems. In fact, this measure is, uh, it, it is supported on the Julia set of, of F. And it's uh, the unique measure of maximal entropy for, for F. No, the theorem is the following. So the first part is, uh, sorry, the first part is, is due to, to Brolin. And it says the following. You take uh, Z in C, and you take uh, the following probability measure, mu index N is 1 over 2 to the N, some over the pre-images, so you sum over y and c such that fn of y is z. So you compute all pre-images of z, and you put the Dirac mass at y, and you get some probability measure. And this sequence of probability measures converges toward mu f, except in a very special case. For instance, if, uh, I mean, except if c is equal to 0 and z is equal to 0. So, except in a very special case where Z is totally invariant under the dynamics. So that's a pure, there is nothing to do with uh, Diophantine geometry here. But now here is a, a statement from Diophantine geometry which is due to these photos. You assume that C is in Q, or Q bar. Assume that uh, Zn is a sequence of points in Q bar. And assume that the canonical height goes to zero. So what is the canonical height? So such that the height, the canonical height for the dynamics of F of Zn goes to zero, where um, canonical height of a point with respect to F is the limit when n goes to infinity, uh, 1 over 2 to the n, uh, height of fn of z. Okay, so here is the measure of the size of the algebraic uh, point fn of z. So it's an algebraic, uh, I mean, it's defined because z and f are defined over q bar, and it measures the size of fn of z along the orbit. Um, using this height that I defined at the beginning. So you, you make this assumption that the height goes to zero, and what you get, um, so you can compute the, a new probability measure, new n, which is sum over y, put a Dirac mass at y, so now y is I mean, runs over all the conjugates of the n, the Galois orbit of the n. Okay, so you have an algebraic number of the n, you look at all its conjugates, you get a cloud of points, and you average on this cloud of points. So here you divide by the degree of the n. Then this limit is the same measure. So you see, we have statements from dynamical systems which are, I mean, which are very nice because they, they work for all points, all starting points Z, but then you produce a sequence of points Zn or Y by looking at the pre-image of Z. And then the limit of the measure is mu F. And in the second statement, you get the same distribution, the same equidistribution, but for uh, clouds of points which are given by Galois orbits, of algebraic numbers, but the property that they have to satisfy is that the height goes to zero when the, with respect to this canonical height. Okay. For instance, uh, pre-periodic points. Okay, so now I want to take uh, five minutes. Uh, it was supposed to be like 20 minutes, of course. 
to explain the geometric Bogo model of conjecture. So what is the meaning of this conjecture? And to say a few words about uh, the ingredient of the proof. Okay, so now I forget about algebraic numbers. I change my field, and the field K, now it's not Q, it's, uh, let's say, C of T, or the function field. Of uh, some uh, complex projective variety B. Okay, so the notation is C of B. And the, the, I will look at abelian varieties A, which are defined over this field K. Okay. So if I come back to my example of an elliptic curve given by a cubic curve, then you can take the same equation. But now A and B are not rational numbers, but functions of the variable T. So if you specialize T, you say, let's say T is, is one or T is two or T is pi, then what you get for each specialization, you get different numbers, A of t and B of t, and so you get a new uh, elliptic curve. Okay, so in fact, what you have is a family of elliptic curve parameterized by the variable t. And a geometric model is just the same data, except that you, you start with what I said. You start with a family of a billion varieties parameterized by the variety B. So the, the picture is the following. Here is B. Here is some Pn. And in B times Pn, you have a family, I will denote it by A tilde, a family of a billion varieties. So for T in B, you have an abelian variety. A index T. And the family of all these abelian varieties form an algebraic variety A tilde in B times Pn. Except that, uh, you see, if the discriminant of this equation is equal to zero for some um, number t, then the curve is not smooth anymore. So, you, so some fibers are not... Um, Some of the fibers may be uh, singular. They are not algebraic. Uh, they, are, they are not abelian varieties anymore. And then you have the group law. For instance, you have the zero, which is a section of this. Uh, thing. Okay, so the, the, the green thing here is just a neutral element. of A is just a family of neutral element in every fiber. If you have a point X in, in A, so defined over K, then you get a family X of T of point in each fiber S of T, so you get some section here. So this is Let's say x tilde. So the family of this point is x tilde in a tilde. If you have a point which is defined over an extension of this field, then you get, in fact, instead of ge getting a section of this vibration, you get a multi-section. For every fiber, you get a finite set of points. Okay. And now what is the canonical height? A multiplication by n. So it's multiplication by n along the fibers. So it preserves each of the fibers. It's just multiplication by n in the fiber. Okay. Uh, 
So uh, you see, I, I, wrote, I wrote a dash R because this map is just a regular map when the, the fiber is smooth, but when the fiber is singular here, for instance, this map is, has an indeterminacy point. Okay. So it's a rational transformation of this uh, A tilde. And the height of X, so height of X is like the volume or the area when B is a curve of X tilde in A tilde. Okay, so the height in this context is like the degree of the volume. Okay, so computing the height is just computing the, the, if B is a curve, is just computing the area of this curve. And so the canonical height is limit when n goes to infinity, 1 over n square, volume of phi n of x tilde. So in fact, the volume you can compute just above the points of B. I mean, you can remove all the singular fibers and you compute the volume uh, where everything is smooth. So I need to state one example and then the, the statement. So the first example is the trivial example. Just take the trivial family. So A tilde is just B times let's say A naught, where A naught is C to the G mod lambda. So in this example, I just take this A tilde is just a product of one fiber times B. For most abelian varieties, of the fiber can be right, written C to the G modulo, modulo lambda, where lambda depends on, on, the, on the point T and on the base. But here I assume that it's the same torus everywhere. Okay. And take a point like that. So take X0 in A0, and you look at the point x tilde zero, let's say x tilde, which is b times x zero. Just an horizontal uh, section of this product. Then the volume of x tilde does not depend on x zero, it's roughly, it's the volume of b. Okay. And now if you multiply by n, so you just multiply by n fibers I mean, in the fibers, so you just multiply x0 by n. So this is just the volume of the point b times n times x0. This computed in n0. And so this is like a constant. So the height <coughs> of such a point is 0. Okay. So we get a lot of points in this trivial example for which the canonical height is zero because the volume is constant when you, when you multiply by n. So this is why in the statement that I will now write, I will assume that uh, this trivial example does not appear in my, in my example, in my abelian variety. Okay, so assume that so I, I will just write it like that. There is no isotrivial uh, family of abelian varieties in A. Okay, so this is exactly the statement which means that assume that I don't see that in A tilde. Then we get exactly the same statement as uh, the statement of uh, Ulmo and Zhang. That is, we prove the Bogomolov conjecture in that case. So the statement is, uh, if x in A is uh, uh, an, irre an irreducible subvariety, And if x epsilon, so the set of points x in x of k bar with height 
less than, less than epsilon is dense in X. So Zariski dense in X for every positive epsilon. Then X is just a torsion translate of a abelian sub-variety of F. So exactly the same statement as before. Okay. So this means that if you have a family of sub-varieties in this family of abelian varieties, so here for each variety you will have some X index T, you have a family of such, var such varieties containing a lot of points with arbitrarily small height, then in fact this variety is, is, uh, is just a torus modulo torsion. Okay. So that's the statement, it's exactly the same. Now I take 10 seconds to explain what I wanted to explain, of course. Okay. It's the, the ingredient of the proof. So the ingredient of the proofs are what? I mean, you will ask me if you are nice to me. Okay, so I stop now. Thank you very much. Okay. And why, so. why do you think about the question? Uh, <laughs> uh, some, 